further conversation for me. We'll get started. We have um, a great lightning talk and feature talk tonight, um, starting with Brandon Lyons, the automatic summer board insertion. Um, and then we have um, Manuel Rueda with the web components, uh, not a silver bullet talk. We're looking forward to both of these talks. And uh, I'm going to bring them up and kick it off. And then it's going to run into this I that's invalid, so a semicolon is going to be inserted right here on line two. And then for the, the final rule, or the, the sub part of the rule, it says if um, the funding token is closing curly brace. So right here we have a closing curly brace on line six. So because of that, automatically we're going to have a semicolon inserted on line five, because there's a new line terminator and then a closing curly brace. So that's rule one, that's all there is to it. Rule two is honestly the easiest rule. It is, as the program is parsed from left to right, the end of the input stream of tokens is encountered, then a semicolon is automatically inserted. Again, it's a little bit fancy. All it means is a semicolon is inserted at the end of the file or the input stream, wherever your code is from. So I don't know why they have to make it like three sentences. It just means insert a semicolon, end of the file, that's it. So on line eight here, we would get a semicolon. And then um, the last rule is when, as the program is parsed, you guys are gonna have to hear me out on this. <laughs> when, as the program is parsed from left to right, a token is encountered that is allowed by some production of the grammar, but the production is a restricted production, and the token would be the first token for a terminal or non-terminal immediately following the annotation within the restricted production. Let's just break this down. <laughs> so, Restricted production, all that means is a continue, a break, a return, a yield, or a throw statement. So again, that's a lot of words to say a simple topic, but if there is a continue, break, return, yield, or throw statement, you cannot have a new line terminator unless you plan on ending that statement there. And then to break this down further, this line, just, all this rule says is that you can't have a line break after certain tokens that I listed above that continue, break, return, yield, or throw, or postfix operations like plus plus minus minus. And we'll look at this rule too. So in this first example on line two, we will get a semicolon inserted because there's a return here. So if you were to have like, say you were trying to return an object down here, um, or just return one down on line three, that wouldn't actually get returned. The function would return undefined because a semicolon is immediately going to be inserted on line two because of the new line. Whereas this is like a more convoluted example um, with a throw statement, but I don't know why you would write your code like this, but if you were to write your code like this, this won't actually throw anything. Um, it's gonna throw, there's gonna be a semicolon inserted on line two here, and then this new error is never, it's actually never gonna execute. Um, you can see it's kind of like 
de-highlighted here. Um, that's because VS Code actually figured out that it was unreachable code and was letting me know through IntelliSense that this code will never be hit. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much the three rules of semi automatic semicolon insertion. Um, so in summary, all that text can be distilled down to this. Be careful when you're beginning a new line with the following characters. Bracket, parenthesis, plus, minus, any operators or curly braces. Avoid continuing the line break directly after any return, break, continue, throw, or yield statement. I can throw that in there. But if you follow those two rules, you, it's near impossible. There are a few other things, but the near impossible to cause a semicolon to be inserted or to have an issue with it. Um, someone made, I'm not going to go over this whole thing here, but someone uh, made this kind of really good flow chart. Um, and I'm going to link to that in the, uh, in the meetup slides if anyone wants to look at this later. Yeah, that's it. Thank you so much, Brandon. That was awesome. Yeah. Um, so yeah, up next we have Manuel. Uh, he is going to be talking with us about web components. Really excited about this talk. So thank you. See how it Uh, I'm going to talk about what's your points um, and how we can use them and can control the frameworks. It's not actually a sales speech to what I'm doing. It's actually based on real experience and how they behave without the frameworks. Um, a little bit uh, about me. About me, I'm originally from Argentina, so you can also speak Spanish. Feel free to speak in Spanish to me, and that's also a warning. If I say something wrong in English, sorry. But well, it's not only a native language. Um, all JavaScript way. Things, um, I go to leave a few links for you to check my stuff. Um, what are our components? Basically, it's a native a standard to create UI and functional components on the browser. It's defined on the DOM standard, so the browser, if they want to comply with the standard, they have to support it, it's not optional. Uh, it takes time because yeah, as any development, they have to catch up, but it's, it's not a, hey, you may support it. They have to, at some point, to say, we support the full spec of DOM. Um, it has a great browser support right now. The only two um, main browsers, well, actually only one main browser that is out is Edge, only for now because Edge is moving to Chromium base and Chromium already supports, so it's going to get solved uh, soon. And for the ones that are in the same nightmare than me, IE 11 is not supported. And well, these people that still use that thing, but sadly, um, a bit, the big difference compared to other frameworks is a few years ago, I'm not going to say names, the whole virtual DOM madness start, and people try to get performance on UI rendering, not using the DOM saying that it was slow and uses the virtual DOM that basically means keeps a copy of your DOM structure not using DOM objects and then diffing that structure with the DOM actual structure and updating only the changes that that's the main point of a big big framework like, framework like React it's what it does um, this is not doing that it's usually actual DOM tree objects and it proves that if it's handled well it can be performant and it can be even faster than the virtual DOM. 
for obvious reasons, you don't have to update two things, you only update with one. Um, it's detecting multiple APIs, so you don't have to go all in if you don't want, like other frameworks. Um, you, you may use Angular to use, use UI, to do UI, and that's going to force you to, until some point to use Angular things that you don't want. It's like, hey, I, I can solve this with pure JavaScript or like some dumb API, and then you start seeing that your screen is not updating because it's outside of the zone for the people that knows Angular, they're going to understand me. It's like the old scope in AngularJS. You're outside of that and things are getting weird because they assume that you go full in. This is based on the spec of the DOM, so it's at the low level that doesn't matter which change you are doing, it's just language, it's just the browser reacting to a DOM tree change. And I'm going to give a, leave that link there, you can check it. It has a really good integration with um, other UI frameworks. Um, someone take the time to actually write tests that test how web components, you can implement web components in an X framework application. Um, Vue has 100%, um, Angular has 100% compatibility, uh, React is a little bit lower, and they have like plenty and plenty there of, of examples. Um, and where are web com where's my, my refresh UI? Okay. Maybe if I do it from here. There you go. Where are web components? Web components is basically um, dissect or divide in three APIs or three main features that I'm going to explain. The first one is the, the, the one that they get conflict, non naming conflict is custom elements. Some people use web components to refer to custom elements, and custom elements to refer to web components. Just to be clear, custom elements is part of web components and not the other way around. Web component is a set of tools. Custom elements is one tool, but the only thing that it does is define the behavior of a tag. When you say an A, an, a, an anchor, or a div, or an image, or any tag, a custom element, those are for, for sure um, built in elements. A custom element, what it does is to um, relate a tag name, let's say x image, x dash image, uh, with a class that is going to define its behavior. And you can extend from native, so you can have your custom image tag. Um, why was the cars alive? Sorry. There you go. Um, I was saying you can extend from native um, a tag like an image like <coughs> div. There's not much sense to extend the div, but image is pretty useful, and it's going to uh, allow you. It's going to allow you to get into the middle of what happened when the DOM tree parts that node. So you have your HTML that is plain text. Uh, when you hand it to the browser, what the browser is doing is it's going to parse that HTML, get all the tags, and start instantiating DOM nodes based on the tag name and the attributes that it has. Normally, if you don't have any um, custom elements defined, and in your HTML you put something like X image or something like that. It's going to just render an empty node that does nothing. If you define a custom element with that called selector, that is X image, what it's going to do is like, oh, I know what that means. I'm going to instantiate that class and I'm going to insert that node into the DOM tree. And it's going to call a few life cycle hooks that we have to, to do things. That's mainly custom elements. Then we have Shadow DOM, that is the most shady part of this pack. Uh, that's the big piece that you may don't want to use. Because it's complicated, it's the thing that has less support than browsers. Again, the same support, i11 doesn't support it, there's polyfields, and H is going to support it soon. H right now, the, the, the H HTML engine, that is the current engine of H, the only thing that doesn't support from web components as a whole is Shadow DOM. It's the only feature. If you don't use it, you can go full native without any problem. No polyfills, no anything. That's the only piece that uh, is not supported. But what it does is 
it's, it has a lot of magic, a lot of underground work on the engine. It creates isolated no trees. So basically when you have a, your dump tree, your whole page, it's only one. The only way to separate is if you use iframes that they don't cascade, for example, style, styles cannot cascade down. You cannot select inside the an iframe without doing some JavaScript, right? It's not part of the DOM spec, it's part of the JavaScript spec. Um, sorry, it's part of the JavaScript, JavaScript layer of the DOM spec, not the, the, the structure. What Shadow DOMs allows you is you have something kind of lightweight iframe that is going to create a node tree that is isolated from the parent node tree. And you can have multiple ones. You can have as many as you want. And that's going to give you a few features. One is CSS isolation. By default, by default, you cannot CSS style that isolated node, uh, node tree with CSS outside of the component. So you, create, you can create your component that has a template, that has its own style, and nobody can modify your stuff from the outside. That's basically what the browsers are doing to build built-in components. When you do a select, a file, that you see that they are composed. You have like a label and an action, or you have a list. Actually, a ready button, all that is a custom built-in custom element that internally is going to have a div and it's going to have the, the native, really native elements that you can use. And they block it, so you cannot style it. And they expose those weird uh, pseudo, -cla pseudo classes to style it. They don't allow you to go directly, you have to go through a specific channel to be able to style it, only if the browser allows. Um, they have two modes, you have a closed mode, that is what the browsers use, that means that once implemented, implemented, nobody can see the content. In the DOM tree, when you inspect like with DevTools, you only see a tag name. And you don't see what is in t inside of it. You can see Chrome and Firefox DevTools allows you to check a box in the settings of the DevTools. I, uh, if I have time, I'm going to demo it. Uh, that allows you to and check that and it's going to show the closed custom elements. And you can see the browser built-in ones and see how they, how they do it. How they build. Um, so basically, Shadow DOM is used for isolation, not um, styling. And the node itself, you cannot select inside a component. The farthest that you can go is the actual component. And if you want to give me a property or um, dispatch an event on me, you have to do it in the component. You cannot go to the span that is inside my component. I'm not going to allow you to do that. It's closed. But again, it's totally optional. You can create custom elements that has a open DOM and they just render content and people can style it and people can select it and people can do whatever they want with your component. Sometimes you want, you want to be open and people customize your component and sometimes you don't want. I will expect some, some critical pieces. You, could, you can always want, it's JavaScript. You can do whatever you want, technically. We, we all know that, um, but it's going to make it difficult. Um, so maybe you want to make difficult if you have a um, if you have a, a credit card form, you want to make it a little bit more difficult to access in, the internals of that, just because of reasons. It's not going to protect you for anything. Remember all the validations in the tracking and all that, the kind of security talk, but it's going to be something. And the last piece is HTML templates. Uh, this is useful even outside of custom um, web components. See, that happens. You make reference to custom one when you say, want to say web component. HTML templates is what it is, HTML templates. It allows you to create a reusable piece of HTML that you can instantiate. So basically in your text, the, the HTML text, not the already parsed version, what the browser gets from the server, you create a template tag and you put HTML inside. That HTML is not going to get inserted into the DOM automatically, but it's going to be parsed. And the browser is going to cache that DOM tree for you. And you can ask for a copy of it. And hey, I, I want that structure again. Give me a new one, give me a new one, new copy, and you create new node trees 
based on that called document fragments. And you can reuse them to update your template. Because if now you had to do document.create element and you create a div and you create an h1 and you do the text content to put the text and you, then you have to append it to the div and the div you have to append it to the component. And if you have a large component, that's going to take you like 50, 100 lines of code. And it's all really verbose. With that, you just write your template, you get it, and you, you, because you wrote it, you know how to travel and select the nodes that you care about. You update the properties, and then you mount that, you mount that node into the browser node. And there you go. The browser will do whatever the template says. That's a really cool feature, not only for custom elements, also for DOM creation. Maybe you want to create DOM, no custom elements, just you're doing some old school plain JavaScript, you can use that, and it's pretty useful. Now I'm going to go to the, let's meet the, the other frameworks and see how they do things and how I make a good comparison, the same component in main frameworks. It's not doing that. I don't want to do that. <coughs> there you go. So in the main frameworks, we have a React Angular Vue.js, lit element and lit HTML. I'm going to explain those. Some people know them, some people don't. Um, Svelte and vanilla JavaScript, that is the, the framework that we love. Um, sorry if I forget your framework of uh, choice. Those are the main ones. <laughs> Let me know, I can add it, you can add it. So the first one is React because people love React. And this is what the basic component looks like. It's not basic, I'm, I'm now actually working on React so probably it's a lot of improvement possible in there. Don't judge me, please. But basically it's a simple component that has an H1 say hi, SMJS friends. And it takes every second and updates it. And it updates a date. It just to show how um, data change just reflect on the screen. I put a link on the bottom of each example of code sandbox with that actual source code, so if you want to play around. So you can see it is a function and it returns um, JSX. You need build time uh, compilation for that. I know you can write the, the pure React.create uh, element, I think it's called, thing and go like pure JavaScript not build time. Uh, but to be fair, nobody does that. Everyone does JSX and compile. Trust me. Um, and then you have to do that render thing that you give a root element, and it's going to like render inside that element your component, and React is going to do the magic for you. And you have the hook magic that I don't want to know what is inside of that to detect my changes. And you have to import use nice uh, ES modules to import your styles. That that also needs build time. You can, can do that directly on the browser. You cannot import styles that way. Um, the main difference, I'll say it, you need a build time process because you have JSX in this example. And in this case, use DOM beeping to update the, the DOM. So every single time that the set interval ticks, it's going to call set now, there's a hook, whatever React does in that place, it's going to say, hey, I have this node this DOM node on my, um, of the node tree. Uh, but I have this new representation of the node tree because something happened. What React is going to do is start comparing, oh, this is a div, I'm going to go to a node, this is a div, yes, okay, it's still a div, fine, I'm going to preserve a node. It's going to go to the H1, hey, it's an H1, it's still an H1, fine. It's just these little things, these little things are called, um, um, text elements, they're not like, it's a weird node that is only text. It's going to validate the text elements are the same, it's going to validate the anchor and it's the same, it has the same age ref, so it's going to be the same, and it gets to the age of two, this is still an age of two, but the value change, and that moment React is going to say, oh, there's a change, I have to update it on, and it's going to update only that. But it has to do the whole chain of checking, every single element. There's no way that it can, it can do it differently. We have Angular. 
Angular level, the curl looks nicer. They have a nicer API. I'm not a fan, I'm not a fan but they have a nicer API. Uh, you need build time for this for sure because it's TypeScript and use uh, decorators that they are not there in the spec. Hopefully they're going to be there in the future. Um, decorator for what we don't know is the little add component. Uh, that's a decorator. It's a TypeScript feature. It's going to be in the SMS, uh, SMS script spec someday, hopefully. They're pretty cool, actually. Um, and you define a selector and you define a template and you have the interval in the same way. Angular does a little bit more of magic because they magically is, magically is going to check if no and now change. If it's now change, it's going to update the template for you. Doing the same thing, it's going to update, it's going to check whatever you have created, blah, blah, blah. Um, but it has a few extra steps, like it has to get this string that you're seeing the template property, and it's going to have to parse it into actual node, HTML nodes creation. Angular does that on build time if you enable AOT, and they create something pretty similar to the React Docker element, but the Angular version of it. Um, but still, they had to do the same thing, they had to check whatever data they have with a um, template. Excuse me. Yeah. In both this and React. Yeah. And there is, are they using the component itself, the, uh, the web component? No, this is this example comparing how to implement a component in different frameworks, and I'm going to get to the custom element at the end. I mean, yes. I mean, I could imagine if I am a writer of the framework, I'll take this API and underneath utilize the web component. Yes. Are they doing that? No. They are not. No. Is any of these frameworks doing it? You can do it in any framework. No, I'm asking. Oh, internally them? Yes. Oh, oh okay. I, 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 I gave you a question now. Uh, let me think. From the ones that we're going to see. I think lit does. Natively, I'm going to get you the don't get ahead, but yes. <laughs> natively, there are two that does, the man, does that thing. That is svelte and kind of svelte and lit HTML slash lit element. I'm going to get you that one soon. Uh, Angular has something called Angular Elements that they create a um, custom element that wraps an Angular element, but it still runs on Angular. It's not truly a, a custom element. Something weird. But you can embed in a side that don't, does not have Angular and it works. They, 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 they bundle all the magic in a little file, little file, and you can import it on the page. Um, now we have Vue, I barely use Vue, so I'm not going to be able to explain much. The only thing I know, they, they, they do this, the same thing. They check in a similar way. Um, and they use the, the .vue file, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, that's the only way I know that you can do it, the view file, and have everything in the same file. I'm not sure there's another way to do view. If there's any Vue user, please let me know. Uh, huh? There's another way. Okay, but that doesn't, most examples you, you see the view file, everything you want. Uh, so again, you need to compile that. Um, and they use like what I, what I call a non-standard non format. It's a standard for them, but it's not like JavaScript or CSS or HTML, it's some in the middle. Actually, it's badly, it's badly like HTML. But. And they will have linked to Then you have lit, FTA, lit element and lit HTML. Those two are libraries, not frameworks, big difference, that are used by Polymer. I didn't include Polymer as a framework because basically they just use these things. And you can use it on your own. You don't need Polymer. Polymer, you get a lot more features like going to Angular. They're like the Polymer is Angular as lit HTML lit element is like, React. They give you the render layer. Po Polymer, they give you way more things. They like wrappers to make requests to the server. They give you a lot of things that you, you may don't want and you want to strip them out. So you can use plain lit element. And this is the most common example of how to do um, custom elements. It's the most non framework. There are uh, other ones like HyperHTML. 
really similar uh, syntax. Uh, what they expose is way closer to what the DOM spec says. You have a class, you extend a class. It is ES6 classes, and you extend a class that is going to define some behavior for you. And you have the only like, I'm going to know the custom things from the HTML and the things that it's using from actual custom element spec. The properties, lead element, define. What it's going to do with that is, if you define an object, it's a static, you define an object, if any of those properties as a member of the class change, it's going to re-render. It's the way that it knows when to re-render and when to not re-render. Um, it has some other features like define attributes over properties, but that goes beyond it. The constructor is a simple class constructor. There's nothing, nothing there. Of course, you have to call um, supper because you extend the class and you initialize your properties there. Connect the call by something actually that is defined in, in custom element spec. It's one of those lifecycle hooks that I mentioned that the browser is going to give you. That thing is called being called when, not when a new component is instantiated, but when the node is attached to the DOM. So you can create a no, a, a, you can do document.create and you put, uh, I know, let's call it x dash example as your selector. That only is going to call the constructor, but it's not going to call connect the call. Like when we, you append it to any piece of DOM, real DOM, not a fragment, not another element, when it gets attached to something that directly descends from the HTML tag of your page, connect the call is going to be called. And that means I'm live. Someone's looking at me, possibly. You can be scrolling down, but you get the point. Um, so you can do things there. And what I'm doing is like, I'm not going to start ticking until actually some, someone adds me to the HTML because what is the case to start ticking if nobody's going to see me? And every, every single time it ticks, it's going to have a no, now, oh. um, lead HTML uh, elements is going to take care of listening for those changes. And when it detects a change, it calls return. Now here is a little bit of magic, but I'm going to try to explain the best I can. The best I can. Render is a method that returns a tag. A tag is a feature of um, a string templates, literally little temp uh, strings, uh, true names can be used on the spec. I personally use string templates. There is a back ticket string that you can interpolate things into. There is a SMS script um, um, feature, sorry, my, my brain freeze, froze. And they also define a cool thing called tags. That is that little word in front of it that is being append to the string, not called, it's not a function, but it gets defined as a function. And what it's going to get when you call that, you're going to get all that string dissect in little pieces. And you are going to get the pieces that are pure string, like purely strings, and the interpolations. What lit HTML does, is the only thing that it does, and it does it pretty well, is it's going to get all those pieces, and it's going to parse it, and start creating the DOM for you. And if you see that string, you notice that the only piece that it can change is in the interpolation. The rest should be static because I'm not doing anything there. It's just an H1 with an anchor and some layers, and that's all static. But the H2 may change. So what it's doing is using a weak map is creating a map between the interpolations of that string and the nodes that it's using. Okay, and it returns that. And with that, it generates a DOM. It goes. It puts the DOM on the actual tree. And it shows. And when the property change, it gets called again. And it gets a new set of fixed stuff and interpolations. And it's going to check, hey, that interpolation that I have, it changed. The string is different. But string map, uh, sorry, string templates are memory reference. You can memory reference the interpolations. So if you have the previous one and get a new one, you know they are the same, 
or they are different. And because they are memory references, you can go to a WCMAG and find the node that changed. So you can have a huge template, and in 11, I'm going, I'm going to say like 10 of deepness, you can have a title or interpolation. The only interpolation of the template should impact that change on the actual DOM. The only thing that it has to do is find the only interpolation, and by reference, it's going to know which node in the DOM has to obey. It's like, oh, it changed the value. Boom, I did the value. It doesn't have to traverse the whole tree. It doesn't have to do any select. It doesn't have to do any diffing. It's only going to do diffing or making com compare things where you put interpolations. You can put interpolations on attributes. You can put interpolations on properties. That is kind of weird because actually it's memory. And you can attach events this way. And during the whole process, is never going to traverse your tree. I took a lot of English. We can leave the questions to the end, but that's a long topic. And how I said, this is used by Polymer. And Polymer is back on that. In that. There is a, a hyper TML. They do the same. Basically, it was really weird. I followed the two frameworks where both start. Hyper TML is a little bit uh, older. It's really weird how they start having the same ideas at the same time. I don't know if they talk each other or what, but that, that was really weird to read because they have the same concepts. There is a really simple code base. It's super lightweight. You can read the code base and understand it pretty easily with all basic JavaScript knowledge. There's nothing crazy or custom there. And then we have move, yeah, then we have a spelt. It's very, it looks like view. You can you, you can agree, please, on me that it looks like view. You have a spell file. You um, declare a script and the main, and there's a, a tabbing problem there. And um, but the cool thing about spelt is you give it that file, and during build file build time is going to create a custom element with the right code to create your template and update your template on build time. It's going to get your template that's inside the main. It's going to create all the elements. It's going to catch, you can see that use the um, double curly braces to define interpolation. It's going to find all the changes, possible changes, and it's going to create JavaScript code that knows what things can change, and the rest is all static. It's real time. The code that produces is pretty clean. You can actually read it pretty easily. Um, I never use it actually on production. Like we don't at work, we don't use it. We use lit HTML and uh, lit element, but it's really promising because it com it resolves a lot of problems on build time, and you're going to be shipping to the browser what the browser expects since the nineties, just HTML, CSS, and plain JavaScript that create notes. It's pretty pretty simple, and they have a, a, a working story on server side rendering because they can because they, they pre-compile everything so they can. And just for the sake of scaring people, this is the example of vanilla JavaScript. This is the part that I'm telling you is not creating the elements. You had to check if it exists because the first time that you call render, um, the nodes may not exist. So you have to check if they, if they exist. And they update only the things that you want, and do a lot of faves and things that you don't want to care about, and you want a framework for that or a library. Let's use library better. Um, and you can see the connect callback, connect callback, a really rudimentary implementation of change checking. I know that my property changed, so I'm going to call render again as many times as it changed. They have better technology on those libraries than what I can do, right? And in, like in 10 minutes. Uh, the main problem is true propose. This, you can use this. This is an example that I didn't add because of laziness probably. Is this mixed with HTML templates. You replace the render with HTML template. And basically in each render you create a whole node tree. It's, it's not as performance as this, but the code looks a little bit nicer. If you have a small component, you don't care that much between this code and recreated the DOM. If the DOM has like 10 levels or something like that, it's, it's so fast that you don't notice. Even if in a, a really old phone, it's, it's completely fine. But you can see that the main format is pretty similar to late element. You extend from a class. Just the native one is called HTML element because I just want to extend from a base, not like 
is like an abstract, it's actually an abstract class. You cannot instantiate HTML element. Uh, it just defines, hey, this is an element and you're going to have the hooks. But you can extend from um, an anchor, HTML, A element, HTML, EMG element, div element, whatever you want. And it's going to behave like the base one and you can tweak the, the things that you don't like or you want to change. And now there's questions. Any questions? Talk a lot, I know. And experience with custom elements. Nothing? Yep. So with Shadow DOM, you mentioned that it's really isolated. Yes. It's pretty common right now to assume that frameworks like Bootstrap are kind of a giant global variable. Yeah. How do you create the isolation of Shadow DOM while also having like a styling framework? CSS properties. So there is a way to feed in some of the outside stuff? CSS code? property is the only CSS feature that goes through Shadow DOM. You define a property on, like, let's say, HTML, the, the root tag, you see it in any shadow DOM. They go through. So you're, if you want to pass the styles to your component, you're not going to pass CSS, pure CSS. The component has to implement CSS that reads and interprets variables, and it adapts to those variables. That's the way that you run through styles to shadow DOM. Uh, Bootstrap and all those frameworks out of the box are not going to work. Basically. So if you wanted like a library of shared styles for your site, how do you get that consistency? Oh, 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 I, I get it wrong. I, I get the question wrong. Yeah. Well, um, that too. Yeah, no, that was a good answer. But, like, let's say you had a, a style guide for your site. Yep. There is a. There is a. There is an API called CSS. It's an actual DOM API. It's not part of Web Components, but it's there. It's called CSS Sheets. And what it does is you define a CSS of like style tag, but it's memory, and you can reuse it. So you can inject in a shadow DOM and a style tag with the styles that you want. Let's say this called a bootstrap style, and have the whole bootstrap thing. But you may say, hey, you are copying like bootstrap thousand times. No, nope. yeah. it's only one. Because the browser is smart enough to know that that doesn't change and it's going to keep only one reference. And it's only memory is the same as having bootstrap. Yeah. That's the way that they provide. Using ESC's modules, the whole thing is, the cool thing is you can import it with, uh, with um, ESX modules. So in that case, you're going to import something that is actually a JavaScript variable that represents your bootstrap style sheet, the whole thing, and you are going to inject it in your component, in the template. And it's going to, uh, how to say, like impact the styles on your component. But the memory for the browser is make a reference to a centralized style. So even though the code looks really redundant, you're relying on the browser to optimize If you go, um, let me see, oh, I'm going to be able to fail it. Let me, let me, let me see. That's the last piece, I'll let somebody else know. I'm not going to be able to demo it, but, um, Basically, when you see in the uh, DevTools where you go, you're not going to see in the style node. You are going to um, see what is called like a um, light DOM. Hmm. That is a term that makes reference to a piece of DOM that is being implemented in a place, but is actually defined in another place. So you're not making a copy. It's making reference to the other. It's also how it's a concept in custom elements. Um, like, I'm going to try to make a reference to many frameworks like Angular or AngularJS people, um, transcription and slotting to put like components inside of, like external components inside of your template. And in React, it will be what it will be. Well, that's, def that's resolved by a create element. You just put it inside, and the React create element is going to put it inside your, um, like, a child. Um, in the browser, we're using custom elements. You just make reference to that like DOM that is defined on the outside. Uh, let me see if I can really quick. We have time. We have time. Well, thank you. I have time? Uh, just tell me to ring the screen so I can make it easier.
I would expect that the page from root HTML has some custom elements inside. If not, it would feel really devastated. Mm -hmm. So the feature, and it's not really big, but the features that I was talking about is, and find it, here. This show user agent shall be gone. User agent is the browser manually, like it means browser. And uh, that's going to enable you to see the shadow DOM from your um, native elements. The reason I want to do that is inspecting to see, wow, they actually did all the plain HTML. Nice. I should go to the examples page or something. That's a good idea. Um, I can try. Hmm, that's good. Okay, the sample is broken, but I have my own set of samples. So, kicks. So, this is inside an iframe because it's like a um, um, code sandbox and an app. So. Can zoom it. I can zoom a little bit. Yep. So I have my iPhone. I have my example dash component. That's my select. And here inside, I have my shadow DOM. That if you look, it looks the same. Yeah, like the dev tools render is the same way as an iPhone with that pound name. It means hey, it's a different um, DOM tree. In this case, it's an open one, so I can get inside. And you can see here. You see. Um, the templates, and you can see that Chrome highlights when the DOM change, like it highlights in, in purple. Uh, so you can see that that now is being updated. Now it plays. You can see the H1 does a change, only the content change, and because it knows by reference, I have to update that thing. And what I need to do is add a select to. Select should be a user agent custom mode. <coughs> yeah. Yes. You can see like select. Normally, if you see this, you're going to only see the options, right? You don't see anything else. But now you see this shadow DOM user agent. That should be a shadow DOM closed, but because I checked that box, it's open it for me. And you can see that actually it's doing a slot. Slot in custom <coughs> and, and Shvelon, sorry, that was Spanish. In Shadow DOM, uh, is the way to use light HTML or light DOM and make reference to things that are on the outside. So if I open my slot, you can see that I have an option, but it's not really an option. I have like a little arrow and it says reveal. And if I press reveal, it sends me to the actual option. It's not copy the DOM. It's not copying my notes, it's actually using my real notes, but using it in a different place of my HTML. This is for the spec, you can use it standalone and do crazy stuff like uh, showing twice the same thing. You can go crazy and do complicated stuff. Yes. It's no longer a tree. It's no longer a tree, exactly. Is that scary enough? <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. The thing is, you can still traverse it as a tree. So that's, that gives me a little bit of hope because it doesn't change how we travel through it. It's not a tree anymore. It's more like a link tree. It's like a sim link in a directory. Exactly. It's like a sim link. It's still a link, but you have like a go to some point and you jump to another place. The computer science word is a directed a slick graph. <laughs> Nuts. <laughs> Or DAG. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, if anyone went to comp size school and you're never sure what a DAG is, here's an example. Looks like. Um, so basically, this is how you resolve um, the style problem. Basically, instead of having like a shadow option, you're going to have the shadow style there. And it's going to make, 
a reference to a style tag that is defined on the head of the browser, like HTML head style. Yeah. This might already answer this, but would like a, if a query selector in JavaScript get you to the same element, but from two different routes through like the symlink route with the shadow DOM and also? Yes. The query is different, but yes. yes. So two different queries will get you this same element. Yes. Okay. Yes. You can, um, you can query inside the slot, it's possible, and actually in many cases is, uh, is, you want it. The, the main example is the select box or any kind of list that you're expecting the people to give you the items. I'm going to give you the wrapper, I'm going to do the wrapper, but you have to give me the items because I, I don't know what the items are, so you have to give them. Um, normally there are two ways to do that. You can give me the data and I'm going to do the items for you, but I own how the items looks like, and that can be tricky. Or you can do like the select. They like, it's an um, element that as a child's component. And the child's are the items. The children, sorry. Um, There's more like React behaves. And they, they do it like a for if internally and you render this stuff. Um, but yes, you can select inside the slot and two queries can match the same element. Um, but the, the, the slot query looks really weird, so if you encounter that case, you're going to figure it out pretty fast. Is the, if I don't remember wrong, is a pseudo selector, like not. You say, okay, reach that slot, and then query inside the slot, slot element, and you put the selector, it's going to run basically in what is called the live DOM, that is a select. So it's like going to go like a, a few levels up. It also has to be levels up for some reason. Um, probably it's a performance reason to do that, to not like go back and forth as many times with the tree. Uh, but yeah, you can select. Yeah. So I know when like in Polymer, you can have like, uh, like have a style tag in your template and do style include. Is that what you're talking about when you're like bringing in those styles? They, they, they sugar syntax it, but yeah, yeah. they do that internally. Uh, lead HTML has the same. They have a class called, um, sorry, they have a string template called CSS that you, inside the string template, you put your CSS, normal CSS, and that string template tag is going to create a CSS sheet object, and they care to append it to the head and append it to your component, and you use the reference and not copy. Uh, a few, let's say six months ago, roughly six months, six months ago, we were copying styles. You copy the same style all over again in every single component, and then when the browser starts supporting that feature, they, 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 they migrate. Um, they polyfill it in a way that if you don't, your browser doesn't support CSS uh, sheets, they copy your CSS. So in the worst case, it's going to work. You're going to have like duplicated code all over the place, but it works. So it's pretty safe. Yep. So you said uh, with the shadow DOM, like sort of selectors, and you, you don't normally have access to the internals of the custom components, right? Yes. So, um, so in that sense, we, you know, you already kind of have that with iframes to some extent. Some extent. Some extent. So a lot of, so just a modern, you know, implementation, a lot of content blockers uh, mm -hmm. look at query strings essentially to match against certain things and block certain things. Yes. The DOM. Yes. Are we going to start needing better tooling yeah. around that? Because I, um, <laughs> I will sell better browsers. This is not an advertisement, but that's why I, I use Brave and not Chrome because they solve it uh, outside the DOM. They okay. don't have to care about that. Uh, yes, it's, it adds a complexity to uh, content blockers. Uh, they have to, uh, the thing is there are ways to recognize if a node is a shadow DOM and get inside. Probably they are already doing it. I expect. iFrames have existed for years. <laughs> yeah, like... so they are already solving from iFrames and basically, uh, I cannot get inside the user agent one. That's, that's actually blocked by the browser. That's impossible. But if you can see there, I can, um, you can see that my, my element is my element, it's just my component. And if I want to like query select, uh, what I have inside, select. I get none. 
because it's like, yeah, no, you don't have anything right there. It's just a thing that I cannot access. What I can do is go get the shadow root. What's the shadow root? Let's try. Long time since I don't use. This is good because you should not use the API that often, so it's good that I don't remember by memory. <laughs> Looks like I remember by memory, that's that. So this is the shadow root, it allows me to jump inside the component, and I access the DOM, and I can do what I can. Um, that, um, set attribute, yeah, anything. Oh, yep. Yeah. There you go. And now you can see the slate has the attributes even being in the outside. Okay. Um, probably I cannot go to the. But that's not a good thing to do. Huh? What? That's not a good thing to do. Oh no 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 no. <laughs> that's why they have the, 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 the weird API had to like shadow root. The point of the component is to. It's be isolation. Uh, yes, you are completely right. That not something that I want to do, but sometimes you have to. Because like that, like I'm wondering, you know, if we're going to start seeing applications built basically with source hidden by default in browsers. Yes. Actually, that's that that's a, that, that's a good point because if uh, I can I can prove it. Who is? Like I always remember like seeing like weird Stack Overflow posts. It's like I want to stop people from reading my source code in browsers because I want to do some weird SQL stuff. Like no, no, the code, say, you can always oh, no. to be able to read the code. Yes, but like, you know, where you're starting to prevent, you know, what if Chrome decides that extensions can't read the shadow DOM or something like that. Like, look like if I try to get a shadow root of the select, it gives me null. Mm -hmm. The reason is, there are two ways to have a shadow DOM, open and close. My example, I'm going to close the console for a second. My example, well, like, lit HTML by default is open. You can make it close. If it's closed, you cannot get inside. No way. It's closed. It's how the browser protects itself to you going and playing around and changing the select and breaking people's pages with an extension or something like that. So if someone does a content injection on your page and they create a closed, a closed shadow DOM to do their content, you're in a problem. You're not going to be able to detect it or remove it. You're always going to be able to detect the component itself. So if they call it X advertisement, you can find that and remove it. You can always remove the whole component. But if in some way they get inside of some things that you need and you don't want to remove, they can create a problem. I ran out of video post this month. So. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> yes. It, it happens, that's why I moved to that browser. They, they block everything on the HTML level. I'm sorry, in the um, HTTP level, they, they do crazy stuff on, um, behind, the, behind the scenes, not in the DOM. Uh, but yeah, that, truly, that create a problem on content injection and content blocking, for sure. Any questions? I'm going to post the, um, the slides, you have the links, I put links like the, the circles with the sections are actually links to the um, MDN documentation of each, not the spec because nobody here wants to read the spec. I follow your lead, they are really verbose and really hard to follow so we go to MDN or some friends and get the simplified version. Um, Again, I encourage you to try it. I'm not saying that you have to use it. It's pretty useful, and it is, you are going to get way more shelf life than using a framework. We are talking like, the browser is not going to break this spec in the following years, many years, because they already defined the spec, and it's been used. If they want to break it, they have to give you a few years, long years, before dropping an API that is defining the spec. It only happened a few times and they give it like a lot of years. Tomorrow something can happen and angry, uh, Facebook drops Angular. And uh, yeah, you have the community, you have the community, but the community change and people start going other places. That happened with AngularJS. You have a lot of community, Google says, I'm shutting down, I'm creating a new thing, and that now it's kind of abandoned. And you have until 2021 to migrate or 
normal support. We're using this to not having that problem anymore. We are buying a lot of years of autonomy. We don't depend on any particular company. We depend on a spec. We use each element. Yes, that depends on the company that end up being Google because it's Polymer. Yes. But what we are using for them is minimal. That's why we are not using Polymer and we are using lit HTML. It's just a rendering engine. It's here's my string, give me my node tree. We can resolve that with another library in, in a few days, even we have wrappers for that. Um, but you are not tied to a gigantic framework for years and then they can ditch you and leave you on the sidewalk. So that's, that's mainly the use I would give you. And uh, you can share components between frameworks. How I said, it works with React, it works with Angular, it works with Polymer, it works with uh, most of the frameworks. Some are easier, some are more complex, but you can embed one of these little guys on any major framework. So if you have a, a large company with many teams working in many frameworks and you want to do a shared component, this is a nice thing because you just code it, ship it, and they implement it. Thank you. So um, I don't have any of the